Welcome back to Operator Syndrome. Uh, once again, uh, we're continuing a, a little series. I say we, it's just me um, narrating these um, PowerPoint slides, uh, talking about Vietnam, the SEALs in Vietnam, um, talking about my friend and hero and mentor, Mike Bailey, uh, the late Mike Bailey, passed away last year, uh, and his dog, Prince. So um, I think this this is the second uh in this uh, little series, um, and I think I have one more um, talking mostly about Mike. I'll be I'll be talking about Mike in this one as well, <clears throat> and referring to him. Um, but I, I thought I'd start out with um, with uh, this this episode being about um, Mike and his dog Prince, and um, some of the first work that SEALs did with dogs in combat. Now it's on a whole nother level. Um, so I thought we would um, take a look. Uh, here, this is a one of the last photos I, I knew of of um, Mike, uh, Master Chief Petty Officer Mike Bailey, uh, decorated Vietnam SEAL, and um, had the privilege of having him as my as one of my phase instructors in Buds, and then uh, later uh, worked in a platoon with Mike. And uh, I mean, most of all, become really good friends, just really lifelong friends. And um, so I miss Mike. I'm kind of dedicating this whole series to Mike and his memory, and. Um, so let's uh, let's get into the material today. So um, today I want to talk about uh, a, a dog who's a real hero. Um, the dog is named is Prince. Um, Mike is an animal lover, and um, <clears throat> if you know Mike, he he loves all kinds of animals. Here's a picture of him in Vietnam with some sort of little jungle. I don't know if it's a monkey. It looks like kind of like a lemur or something like that. I, I don't I don't know if they have those in Vietnam, but it. I can't tell what, what what this animal is, but it's licking Mike on the nose. And um, he really, he always loves animals. He always loved animals um, uh, ever since I'd known him. Cats, dogs. He'd even train these little kit foxes out on San Clemente Island. He would feed them crackers and they would they would come and just like get almost tame um, these little wild foxes that that were indigenous to San Clemente Island. Anyway. Um, Mike's an animal lover, so it's it's no it's no surprise that he really took to to Prince and to his duties in Vietnam with Prince. So wanted to talk a little bit about Prince. This is another photo. It's a black and white photo. How he got a red tongue, I have no idea, but it's kind of cute. Anyway, um, he he was German Shepherd, uh, a very aggressive German Shepherd, according to Mike. He said uh, he his big problem was with Prince uh, was. Um, um, keep him, keeping him under wraps as far as he wanted to attack things and people and other animals. He was, he was, uh, aggression was his number one challenge, according to Mike. Um, he even got in trouble with an admiral because he killed a water buffalo in, uh, in this neighbor, in one of the villages, um, which the villagers weren't too happy about. Uh, but anyway, this is Prince. And I thought I'd talk uh, initially about the dog himself and um i'm, I'm going to read um a first-hand account of, of what he did on one particular occasion which is just phenomenal i mean he he saved basically the entire platoon um but um thought i'd, I'd start by saying um prince's first handler was a guy named chief bill brewmiller um or brew muller I, I don't know i'm not exactly sure how to pronounce it and he trained prince uh at, at a an attack military police school so he was first trained as an attack dog but of course in doing so he 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 was trained to follow orders and to be very obedient which he was mike said he he would always obey him um so uh so then mike took him to fort benning to train him as a scout dog so brew miller was the first handler and as a matter of fact he has an account of prince in here this this book uh called Navy SEALs, A Complete History from World War II to the President by Kevin Dockery. I don't know if you can see that. Um, it is an excellent account of, of Vietnam and and, and also it, it, it's probably the most comprehensive. Um, the other one by um, Milliken, uh, Benjamin Milliken by Water Beneath the Walls is, is right up there too. But this goes a little further. This was published in 2004. Um, Milliken's book only brings it up to about the early 70s so anyhow so mike 
took Prince to Fort Benning uh, after Brumiller Br worked with him in Vietnam. The first deployment was with Brumiller, and then Mike had him, I think, for two more deployments to Vietnam. So when Mike got Prince, he took him back to uh, Fort Benning to, to learn scout, um, what's called scout dog techniques. Um, and a scout dog is one that goes off airborne scent. Um, and the reason they wanted this is so that he could alert if uh, Viet Cong or NVA were approaching them on patrols, Mike said when they had Prince with them, they never got ambushed. Um, and you're going to read an account. I I'm going to read. Sorry, I'm going to read an account here in a minute. You'll you'll hear an account of what what he did on one occasion. But um, anyway, so Mike said sometimes they would set up an ambush along a trail or a river where they were expecting arms to be transported, and you know on ambushes after pumping in for a long way you know you're tired he, he said he he as long as he was awake and he had prints he said he would tell the guys hey take a nap if you want because it might be a while and guys could get a little bit of sleep a half hour an hour and then um he said prince would start to alert he would his head would do like this and then he said his ears would go forward and he would know his nose would start going up in the air and he would know he'd start waking guys up and go all right it's, it's time for action so that's just uh, one kind of anecdote about about Prince. But um, so he trained him as a scout dog and Mike worked with him as a scout dog, um, a den a finding finding enemies uh, in um, off airborne airborne scent versus like bloodhounds that go on the ground ground scent where they'll track where somebody's been. So there's two kind of approaches to dogs using their nose. And obviously the dog's nose is the number one asset in addition to their physicality and athleticism and being able to attack, uh, attack somebody. Um, so anyway, uh, that's a little bit about Prince. Um, Master Chief Brewmiller makes, tells a funny story about Prince when he had him in Vietnam, he said they were taking a break somewhere on patrol and all of a sudden Prince disappeared for a couple minutes. He just wanted to run around. He would, he would tell Prince, okay, it's break time. And Prince would go off and, you know, he knew it was his time to run around versus, you know, getting in character for, for uh, a mission. And he said, they were all just sitting around, you know, and then here comes Prince with something in his mouth. And he said, he's always wanting to have, to have somebody throw a ball for him. He said, he dropped it. He dropped what was in his mouth and it was a grenade. Uh, and, and he said, he, first he was, it was like, Whoa, you know, cause obviously that's potentially danger, dangerous. He said he went away and, and brought another one back. And he did this like three times. And so finally, Brumiller follows him and he found, Prince found a cache of, of weapons, ammo, and grenades that were that were either Viet Cong or NVA, I don't recall. But in any case, just kind of a humorous, kind of a terrifyingly humorous story. But uh, um, he, he must have been a character, Prince. Um, wish I could have known him. Um, he never made it home. They euthanized him in Vietnam after... Mike's uh, deployment and when he was headed home he was getting older as well so he Mike was crushed because he wanted to bring Prince home and have him as his own dog but um the admiral overrode that as as happens I want to thank Judy Bailey Mike's uh, widow uh for giving me this um the story it was it it was really hard to read it was a scan of like a copy of a copy of a copy and so what I did is I retyped it. It took me a little while. And so I have this this uh, document right here. Well, you can't see it. My screen's doing something weird. It's called Hero Dog Prince. It was written by um, a, 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 an officer in charge of a SEAL platoon named Gary Parrott. I don't know what his rank was, probably lieutenant junior grade or lieutenant back in that day. Um, and so I retyped it. Um, so if I did make any mistakes, they're, they're mine, not not Gary's. Um, Gary died of esophageal cancer in 2021, I think. Um, let me let me make sure about that because I want to be accurate about it. Um, 2021, yeah, um, sadly. Uh, but here's a firsthand account of what what Prince did. And by the way, for our listeners out there, and again, top my hat to Judy. She she's the one that sent it, emailed it to me. And um, so I retyped it and turned it into a PDF that's real clear to read. Um, so if any of you want this, I'm I'm sending a copy to the UDT Seal Museum in Fort Pierce, Florida for posterity, but also for, for the archives, because it's another firsthand account of Mike and Prince. 
and this platoon in Vietnam. So uh, if you want a copy of this, uh, I'll be happy, myself or Patrick or one of us, either of us, uh, we can forward this to you. If you want to email us and, and request a copy, I'll just send you the PDF, uh, no charge or anything like that. Um, it is uh, operator syndrome podcast at gmail.com. Okay, but before I start reading the story, and I hope it's not too impersonal that I read it, I just think it's well written. It's um, it, it, it's accurate, and um, I don't I don't want to summer. I, th I I thought I thought about should I just try to summarize it, but I think it'll be better if I read it. Um, so um, um, we'll see how that goes. As you can see on the screen, there's a map of, of Vietnam. <clears throat> this is about the best one I found. Couple couple of things that will relate to this account that I'm about to read. Down in the very far south in that yellow area is what's called the Mekong Delta. The Mekong is a river that runs all the way up into Cambodia and then into Laos and, and parts of Thailand. Um, it's a very, very long river, the largest in Southeast Asia. And um, this was an area, especially down in, um, um, in, in the Mekong Delta, you can see that fingery where it deltas out down there, where it empties into the ocean. There was a lot of seal activity down there. SEALs worked in the Mekong Delta a lot. And a lot of it was um, the Viet Cong and the NVA were running arms uh, uh, down the river in what's, what are called sampans. Um, there's a big scene of this in uh, the, the movie Apocalypse Now. Um, but in any case, uh, that was a main area that they worked, but they had trouble with dogs in that area because there was so wet and muddy that the dogs almost made more noise than it was worth. Um, so this story talks about, if you look up the coast here, there's a city called Quinan or Quinan. Um, um, it, it's just above, you see Ho Chi Minh City, then you see Ne Trang, um, and then above that is Quinan. Um, so this is a this is a mission they did up there, um, kind of, I think it was in two core, two or three core, I, I can't remember. Um, but anyhow, so... So let me just go ahead, and this is Gary Parrott's account, who was the officer in charge of this platoon on this particular mission. All right, so here we go. <clears throat> night after night, our SEAL squad operated in the low-lying territory of the Mekong Delta, snatching important prisoners, cap capturing documents, ambushing waterways, and raiding Viet Cong camps. All the operators, all the operations, sorry, didn't produce results, but enough did. One day, the command brought us down to Kanto from an operation on the Cambodian border with orders to move halfway up the country to a region of mountains and coastal sand dunes. The city of Quinan had intelligence that an elite battalion of North Vietnamese Army NVA regulars were moving toward Quinan to mount a major attack. It was totally different terrain and a much tougher enemy while the Viet Cong were poorly trained, the NVA were hardened, competent fighters, especially in the NVA E-2 Bravo Battalion, moving in on Koi Nan, which was an elite unit of, of a, with a top reputation. The SEAL Command heard about the success Marines and Army were having using scout dogs trained to alert when they sensed Vietnamese. So they trained a SEAL and a dog named Prince to try out in the Delta. Unfortunately, in the wet terrain, the dog made more noise in the water and the mud than the seals did. Then, too, the Delta was densely populated region with Vietnamese sent all on all the trails and rice paddy dikes. It was just too confusing for a dog. But when we were headed for the mountains and sand dunes, a place with no civilian population and dry land for a change. In Canto, we met Prince and his handler, Mike. That's Mike Bailey. We were impressed with both and glad to have them along. One one other thing I'll mention is that Prince would, he he couldn't, Mike told me this, he couldn't distinguish between Vietnamese. He, in other words, they all tended to eat the same kind of a high fish diet. Um, they had a similar um, smell and that's what he went off. So he's going to be very confusing for him to distinguish between a civilian and a, and a Viet Cong fighter, even an NVA because of the similar diet and the similar smell they had. That's why when you get into an area where there's no civilians and you have military movements, that's when he could really do his thing. In addition to not being in and out of the water so much. <clears throat> okay. Continuing on our first night's operation 
Uh, we went out with just one squad of SEALs to reconnoiter the area. We crossed the Queen Anne Bay in small boats and climbed up the sand dunes on the other side. On top of the dunes, the only cover was intermittent clumps of low brush. We patrolled along the sand ridge until we came to a big trail leading down into the valley below. The trail was apparent from, from the air and it made the Quinon command suspicious. Why such a well-used trail in an area where there was no population but the NVA? The Quinon intelligence section began calling this trail Broadway. We set an ambush there where, sorry, we set an ambush where there were, where this trail crested the ridge and soon we heard activity where the trail met the bay below us. The clunks and bumps sounded like weapons and ammo being stockpiled. Soon we shared an ambush, uh, we shared an ambush where this trail created, no, sorry, crested the ridge and soon we heard activity like weapons and ammo being stockpiled. A large sand pan, that's a boat, uh, like a narrow, it's a bigger than a canoe, but it's a canoe shaped boat that they used on the rivers. Uh, <clears throat> a large sampan glided up to the point where the sounds were coming from. We all figured as soon as the shipment was made, the NVA would move straight up Broadway into our trap. It was just too good. We'd have the high ground, and they'd have nowhere to hide. For good measure, we called the gunship helicopters in Queen Anne and told them to get ready to scramble. The activity below continued for another hour until the sampan headed back for Queen Anne. The NVA below began moving up Broadway, and we scrambled the choppers, expecting a quote-unquote turkey shoot, meaning an easy run, gun runs um, on, these, on these soldiers, with a total advantage on our side. The choppers took a long time getting in the air, and to our surprise, the NVA took a shortcut, angling up the ridge to the north. We could no longer see them, and they were moving out, out of range by the time the gunships arrived, and the quarry was long gone and so was the heavily laden sampan. However, we were fortunate to have observed their movements and knew how to set up in the right place next time on this kind of shortcut trail that they hadn't counted on. When dawn came, we checked the shortcut and found where it crested the ridge, 100 meters to the north. Two nights later, half the platoons would be there. We moved down downhill and checked out the site at the water's edge, where we found a big camouflage bunker and some packing scraps from mortar rounds and rockets. We studied the low ground and found a small creek with the NVA trail running along its north side. There was cover on the south side, and that's where we planned to put the other squad two nights later. We were disappointed in the helicopter and the choppers late scrambling, so we went out to see them as soon as we got back to Queen Anne and told them what a turkey shoot they'd missed. We got to know those pilots on a personal basis and had a few beers, told stories, and let them know that if we called, they'd have to get back to us quick if they wanted to get some shooting. The pilots were so eager to shoot, they said they'd pre-flight their birds and be standing by their choppers all night, ready to go on the flip of a switch. Two nights later, we repeated the operation based on our new knowledge. Our two seven-man squads patrolled up into the top of Broadway, where we left one squad with instructions to wait and listen for 30 minutes. If nothing was heard below, they would move down to their ambush site on the south side of the stream. Meanwhile, our squad moved out to our pre-planned ambush site at the top of the ridge where the shortcut trail came up from below. Prince led the way in front of Mike, along with our point man, Brew. When we got within 30 yards of the ambush site, I sent Mike, Prince, and Brew forward to select ambush spots for the rest of the team. I later learned that as Mike moved forward, Prince suddenly took a strong alert. When Mike took a step around him, Prince moved in front of Mike to block him. It was obvious the NVA were close at hand. Mike and Prince went into fetal positions under a bush. I had no idea what was going on up there, but they'd been gone way too long. Finally, my patience wearing thin, I crawled forward in the dark. As I passed a bit of scrub, a hand shot out and grabbed me. It was Brew, who quickly slapped his hand over my mouth. He put his lips to my ear and whispered, they're all around us. I heard or saw nothing in the black night, but Brew was laying there in the fetal position, and that made me believe him. Soon there were low Vietnamese voices in the pitch black night, close voices. 
We couldn't have been in a worse situation. If the SEALs behind us opened fire, we'd be in the kill zone. If the NBA stepped on us, there would be a shot and a firefight. Soon, matches flared and the red glow of cigarettes appeared. The NBA were, NBA were having a smoke break right there at the entrance of the cutoff trail. Lying under that bush, I have never been so scared in my life. As the seconds passed, I felt the premonition of bullets tearing into me. If Prince hadn't alerted Mike to the oncoming NVA, the names of everyone in our platoon would be chiseled on a black onyx wall today. The enemy around us put out their smokes and moved down the trail toward the second squad's position. We scrambled the choppers and then notified the squad below, below us that a patrol was moving down the trail toward their position. We're ready for them, came the reply. <clears throat> Things happened fast after that. Heavy gunfire and tracers erupted from the second squad's position on the south side of the stream. I heard the other squad radio for the choppers and a pilot radioed back, we got you in sight. But then we heard the second squad calling for a medevac. Something wasn't going right. For the next 30 minutes, it was mayhem. The gunships made gun and rocket runs, hosing down the area north of the stream, trying to suppress fire, which kept the med medevac chopper from landing. The medevac helo with a cool pilot talk, talking calmly on the radio, tried to get in but had to flare off due to heavy fire. He tried again, and this time he picked up, not just the wounded seals, but the entire squad. With the extra weight, he was barely able to lift off and get airborne. He flew ju just feet over the water with the engines screaming. Now, I'd like to insert here, Mike told me this story, um, retold it uh, to me uh, at one point, and he said they didn't they they didn't even tell the helicopter pilot how many people they had on there because he they thought they would kick some of them off, but they just wanted to get out of there. And he said uh, the the pilot the crewman yelled back, "How many do you have?" And and somebody yelled uh, or the pilot yelled, uh, "How many do you have?" And um, they said five. We've got five people when they actually had eight plus a dog, which was. Uh, a little white lie, but they got out of there barely. Um, the, bear, the the helo barely took off. But I remember Mike retelling me that one. Back to the story. We called in artillery on the enemy, and those big rounds came howling in. On the ridge, we began taking fire from another group of NVA coming down the trail behind us, the first bunch. We broke contact and withdrew to the top of Broadway while the choppers put firing runs on the NVA. With their ammo gone, they were light enough to pick us up and fly us back to Quinon. We watched the artillery rounds landing on the enemy as we flew across the bay, the hero dog Prince and all. There's no doubt in anyone's mind that if it hadn't been for Prince, our whole squad would have been wiped out that night. <clears throat> the medevac, with its calm talking pilot, landed on the tarmac, but he hadn't enough power to lift off again, so he dragged his skids right up to the hospital entrance where the medics were waiting. Soon we were at the hospital with the others. All the wounds were from grenade shrapnel. Two of the SEALs were sent to the hospital in Japan and then back home. We checked our ammo and most of the SEALs were down to their last few rounds. Two nights later, we had attacked a high-level meeting on an island in the bay where we captured several haversacks of top secret documents outlining the entire battle plan on Queen Anne. Another bag of documents listed all the political infrastructure and their codes. With the NVA battle plan out of the bag, the attack on Queen Anne never happened. On that raid, Prince took a shrapnel wound, which earned him the first of what would become three Purple Hearts. One hero dog kept our squad from being wiped out and saved Queen Anne from a vicious attack, which would have killed countless civilians. For that, he got a T-bone steak instead of his usual kibble, and he thought it was a fair trade. End of story. Uh, post note, the story was written by Gary Parrott, OIC of Hotel Platoon, SEAL Team 1, as he was dying from esophageal cancer in 2021. Gary served in Vietnam with Mike Bailey and Prince during July 1968 to January 1969. So... Wow, quite a story, huh? Um, I love this one. This is Mike. Um, it's hard to see. It's it's from a newspaper. Mike is standing to the left with Prince holding holding his collar, and this is a uh, captain, a Navy captain, awarding Prince the Purple Heart. 
I said I thought he had two purple hearts. He actually had three purple hearts. So this dog, and Mike said on one of the missions he had with Prince, he had been shot. Uh, Prince had been shot, um, but survived, survived all three of those um, wounds. Um, so what a dog and what a story about how much a dog can do to help us. Um, I've witnessed this. I mean, I've seen some of these dogs and they're, they're incredible athletes. They're just unbelievable uh, creatures. Um, but something always, I think, so thrilling to see how an animal can actually, you know, save the day and, and help us in ways that, you know, are, are almost preternatural with their, um, their, their great senses of uh, especially smell. Um, so great story. Uh, here's my last picture. This is my favorite one of Prince. Um, I, I, I played this in the first, um, the f uh, first slide of, of this whole presentation. And um, there you see him with his purple heart around his neck. Pretty cute. Um, anyway, that's about all I wanted to talk about today. Um, I have I have another episode. I want to just talk mostly about Mike and maybe a couple of stories about Prince, but um, wanted to get this one on the books. And so I uh, hope you've enjoyed a little taste of an incredible dog and an incredible Navy SEAL. Thanks. Thanks.